so in this section, we're going to take a look at threading issues. And threading issues, well, even though that's the name of the chapter, that's not really what we're going to be talking about. Really, what we're going to be talking about is kind of some um, extra features that are associated with threads. Um, and well, one of, them, one of them will kind of give us a little bit of trouble, but this isn't you know, going to be a section about all the stuff that can go bad. I mean, there are many things that can go bad, but really we'll see those in the next chapter when we take a look at process synchronization, right? That section is going to be about how you know, we have you know, different threads running at the same time, different processes running at the same time, and when they talk to one another, sometimes things can go very wrong. So we'll talk about that later. For now, we're just going to kind of uh, make, have some, some commentary, right, on how threads and processes work. Well, how threads work right now. So first thing I want to talk about is signals. So right now, right, we have this idea of I have kind of entire programs running, right? I have entire processes, entire threads running, right? Uh, and they can maybe communicate with, with between one another um, a little bit, or they have the ability, for example, right, to wait for another one to complete. Uh, well, what we have here is basically another mechanism whereby a message can be transferred between threads or between processes. And this is going to be called a signal. This is something, right, that's, that's very much a, a Linux thing. Um, the idea is basically this. Um, sometimes, right, you have a, a thread that's running, right, or maybe you have, you have two threads that are running. Uh, one of those threads that's running, right, um, maybe it's just going along, it's just doing stuff, everything is fine, right? And then and that second thread, that second thread suddenly finds out, oh, that first thread needs to go do something. For example, I need to shut that thread down because it's computing something that I don't really need to and need to use anymore, right? So it doesn't make sense for me to leave that thread running. So what I'll actually do is I'll say, okay, I'm going to send across a signal to tell that other thread something, right? And a signal in this case is going to be, well, technically it's an element of an enumeration, but what it is is basically this little token of, of text that means something. So it may say something like, uh, you know, do, do this, right? Maybe it's time to, uh, you know, close out, right? So free memory, you know, deallocate everything, uh, end whatever it is, the current action that you're doing, right? But there's going to be this little token of information, right, that basically gets pushed across, right? So it's like a message that's being just broadcast directly from one thread to another. And that second thread, right, that second thread doesn't need to be waiting around for anything, right? Basically what will happen is that thread will be, uh, basically it'll be interrupted, right? So even if it's in the middle of doing something, it'll be forced by the system to acknowledge the signal and go and act upon it. So this is the basic thing we're talking about here. And on the bottom and on the right-hand side, I have actually the syntax, right, um, in terms of, uh, of Linux, right, and how to do this. Okay, so looking down at the bottom, we have the kind of four, you know, familiar functions that we're going to use when we're using um, signals in, in, inside, of, inside of Linux, right, and specifically with respect to kind of some pthread stuff. So first thing we have, right, is this thing called signal. Basically what that's going to be is that in one of our threads, right, the one that basically needs to wait for something to happen, right, needs to wait for a signal, uh, well, what will happen is in that particular thread, what I need to do is I need to set up some sort of handler or some sort of callback, right? So what that's saying is, okay, um, I need to say that there is this method or function, right, that should be run whenever this signal is received, right? And the way I kind of tell my program that, right, is with this signal uh, function, right? So a signal function takes two things. One is it takes a, a signal enumeration. Basically, it's saying that, okay, this is the particular um, signal tag, right, or signal name that's going to be watched for. And then when I get a signal from that that has that tag on it, well, then I'll go ahead and execute the handler that's associated with it, right? So that's the second argument there in our signal uh, function, right? So we have our signal number, right, the message being broadcast, and then the function to act upon, right, or the function to trigger, which is called handle. So that's kind of the first thing we have, right? So the kind of the recipient of a signal needs to have that stuff set up. The second thing we have there, right, is ray. So basically what that's doing is that is sending a signal um, to kind of our own process, right? Remember, we could be in some sort of thread, right? There's going to be maybe a bunch of threads, right, associated all with the same process. If we do, ra do rays, right, what we're doing is we're broadcasting the signal, right, to the people basically around me, right? To, the, to that one context of that one thread, right? So then there's you know, that one process, right? And so then some other thread, right? Maybe even the main process, right? It's going to pick up that signal, right? And react to it, right? So you can maybe think about raise me a little bit like, you know, um, throw in Java, right? When we throw an exception, right? And we have to basically push this, this error message upward, right? Until somebody can catch it, right? We, we're starting that chain of events. That's what raise is doing here, right? Is it saying, okay, I need to start, I need, I need to, to broadcast out this signal message so that somebody else can deal with it. Then the other thing we have here um, is kill. Now, kill is kind of funny because it's called kill, but it doesn't have anything actually to do with killing processes or threads. Um, apparently, that's like a legacy name. That's like that's what it used to do, right? In previous versions of the kernel, is it would actually destroy a thread or destroy a process. Um, but now, actually, what kill does is kill is a way um, to send again a signal, right? So it's going to work like raise. The difference here being is that when we use the kill command, what that is saying is um, direct that particular signal to a specific process, right? So in this case, I'm actually allowed to say where it's going, 
right? Rather than raise, which just kind of defaults to, oh, what is the current process that is running, right? Now I have my choice. Other than that, they're the same thing, right? So don't think that kill has, anything, again, anything to do with, you know, shutting down a thread, right? Uh, it doesn't in this case, right? In the past it did, right now it doesn't. Um, pthread underscore kill, right? Uh, we already said kill isn't about destroying stuff, right? That particular function, right, is the way that we can send a signal, you know, instead of just to a, a process, um, but actually to a specific thread, right, that's associated with some other process. A little bit more specificity there. Now, just to touch on the kind of the title of this section, the reason why they call this section threading issues um, is because when we use these commands, right, these, uh, the raise and the kill, um, the issue with those, potentially, right, is that if I set a signal to just a process that's running, how do I know which thread is supposed to handle that, right? I mean, maybe I get lucky. Maybe I have only one thread out there that has actually, you know, a signal handler, handler registered for that particular message. But I'm, you know, I shouldn't make that assumption, right? That's a bad assumption, right? I may have to deal with a case where I have, you know, multiple threads that are all set up to handle that one signal, right? That one little token, that one little bit of text that says this is what happened. Uh, and then I need to decide, you know, what do I do with that, right? Um, so that's why this kind of discussion is in the issues section. And there's several ways you could resolve that, right? So simple ways maybe is, you know, if, if you don't have kind of a unique recipient, uh, maybe you can have kind of a priority thing, right, where you say, okay, this thing gets it before this thing, before this thing, before this thing, right? Maybe you have a round robin thing where you basically say, okay, everybody's in line, and as I get new signals, right, I'll just pass them in turn to all my different threads and let them just deal with, with whatever they get, right? So there's different ways to resolve that. Um, for us, it's not going to be too big an issue, right? Just kind of understand that the basic idea of, oh, this is about, you know, taking a signal from one, uh, taking a, a message, right, calling a signal, sending it from one thread to another immediately, right, without any waiting taking place. Now, on the right-hand side, I have the rest of the syntax here for doing this in Java. So let's take a look up here. So what I have here defined, right, there's really two parts here. Um, this bottom part, which I'm going to label as two, just trust me that the top part says one. I know it's not really readable, but it's fine. Um, the bottom part there, right, is, is labeled as two. Um, so that would be actually in, in basically a program, right, that wants to set up the ability to respond to a signal. So there what I'm doing is I'm registering this thing called uh, sig int target as kind of the function that will be called when a signal is triggered, right? So I'm in, I'm some program, right, has this code in there, right? I receive a signal um, sig int, right? So just an interrupt, right, or some sort of issue that occurred, right? When I get that, that right will end up being will end up triggering my sig in target, right? So that's kind of the function that'll be run when that happens. Now, up above, that's where I have sig in target defined, right? So I have this one one function here, right? And so that function, right, normally it's just going to be, well, it's just defined, right? It's just waiting around, right? But when I get that signal, right, because I've registered that particular function as the handler, right, or as the callback for that uh, particular signal, right, that sig int then that code will run, right? So it's almost, it's a little bit almost like a go-to, right? All of a sudden you're telling your program, when this happens, go to this point, right? Jump up into this function, right? Run this printf, displays that information. Okay, so then another note here, right, is that, is that I'm a little bit restricted on the functions I can actually uh, bind as a handler. Basically, I have this requirement where they should be, you know, a void return type, and then they should have this, this parameter over here, which is int, signum, right, which is basically going to be this variable that contains a particular type of message that was being transmitted from some other thread to my thread, right? So even though I have my choice in kind of what is the name of that function, my return type, my parameters, that needs to be the same, right? That's kind of defined somewhere, right? If you go look at, for example, the function signal, the function um, signature, right, for signal, you'll see that signal is set up, right, so that when, you, when I pass in a function, it has to look like that, right? We can't just arbitrarily pick things. So a little bit of a limitation there. Uh, but that's just thing, the way we want things, the way things have to work, right, if we want to say, okay, this function is bound to this particular event. So take what we can get. Now, say we have, right, our thread that has both these two parts, right, the code, right, that's going to be run when an event, when a signal happens, then the code to kind of bind that function to that event. Uh, that's kind of it, right, for kind of our second thread. But then our first thread, right, the thread that wants to, you know, trigger the event, how does that look? Well, that will need to use raise, right, so that ends up looking uh, over here. Right, so this is basically saying, okay, my thread one, thread one will do a raise, right, on our sig int, right? So it's going to send out that message, right, to kind of the current process. Current process will look around and say, oh, hey, this other thread, right, that one's actually set up to handle this event message, so it probably belongs to them. Send that message across, right? And um, then that other bit of code, right, that has, that's in that function, right, that was bound as a handler, then that stuff executes and that information will be printed out. So 
There you go. That's kind of a little example, right, of how uh, we can, you know, create a make a thread send a signal across and then make the other thread act upon, you know, seeing that signal. On the last bit of text here, right in the bottom of the slide, saying wire signals di discussed as thread issues, right? We already talked about it, right? There's the, always the kind of the issue, right? Is oh, I have a bunch of threads, send a message, to the pro send a signal to that process. How do I know what thread it ends up with, right? And there's a few ways we can handle that. Um, not too big a deal for us right now. All right. Uh, well, this is, I'm just changing slides here. Then it's one slide here, and then and then we're good. Yeah. So let me just try to catch my breath here. Okay. Okay. So last little bit here. These are kind of miscellaneous topics, um, but we're going to mention them since they are mentioned in the textbook. Um, the first is thread cancellation. So thread cancellation is basically saying, okay, you know, in addition to you know sending a signal across and saying, okay, it's time for this, you know thread to end. Um, actually, in P thread, there's also some functionality, right? We can also use to say, okay, you know, this particular thread, right, you're, you know, I want to cancel you, right? I don't have any, I don't have any use for you in the future. You, you can go and, and release those resources back to the system, right? So we don't have to force things with a signal, right? Sometimes signals are a little bit abrupt, right? They're working roughly like an interrupt, right? And interrupts are, to me, they're not always a good thing, right? Because you're interrupting something that is computing. So there is a little safe way to, to handle with just destroying uh, threads. Uh, the second thing here right, is thread local storage, right? Um, so normally, right, we said that threads, right, threads are very lightweight. They basically all use the same memory, right? The memory that the process had initially requested. Um, all those threads basically get to, get to share that. And then, um, you know, they can kind of use that maybe to communicate. They can use that to store results. And at the end of the day, when the threads are all, you know, shut down, your main process still has access to that stuff. Well, in addition to that, right, in addition to kind of the shared memory provided by the process, we also have kind of some thread libraries that allow for local storage, right? So basically, whenever our threads start up, we get to create our own memory. We can do some changes in there, right? We can use it as a working space. Then maybe at the end, right, then that thread will write something to the global memory, and then it closes out, and then the process can get at that, right? So basically, it's a way to say, yeah, there is, there is a way, right, to create basically variables that are just inside each of our threads, which is, which is useful, right? It's working space. Uh, final thing here, schedule activation. So the book is a little bit um, odd in the terminology I use here, but basically the idea is this. I have a bunch of threads, right? And we I said, oh, those threads, right? Somehow I need to, to map them, right, from user space to kernel space. How do I do that, right? We had a little discussion on that. Um, but then the book introduces this idea of LWP or lightweight processes. Uh, basically, the idea is this, uh, and this is specific to Linux. Um, in Linux, basically under the hood, um, threads end up getting mapped to these LWPs, these lightweight processes, uh, because Linux doesn't really have a separate idea of a thread. So instead, it has these lightweight processes. And by lightweight, it means it doesn't have, you know, resources that are, are bound to it permanently, right? It's really just doing shared resources. Um, basically, there are legacy reasons, right? So Linux, way back when, right, they didn't really have, you know, this kind of, you know, from the ground up you know, threading support, right? And so they kind of, I don't want to say hacked it, but they did a little bit of, uh, of things, right, differently, right, than you may, may have done if you had architected everything up front. And so in the end of the day, right, basically we just have these LWPs, right, in the kernel, right? The kernel doesn't know anything about threads. All it knows is there are processes, and then there's lighter weight processes, right? And then those threads get mapped down to the lighter weight processes. 